Good afternoon. I really haven't been to Moscow for a long time. How the Petersburg audience is changing, I more or less know. I would like to see the Muscovites. I've not been here for three years. Indeed, the last time I spoke here was in this hall. The subject of my message is marked as follows. The civilizational triangle, East-West Russia, at a new stage of globalization. But when I was on the train today, I was thinking about the title of this lecture. But also before that, I had realized that the topic of the lecture had to be called differently. But I didn't do it. Let me explain why. Those who were at my last speech in St. Petersburg on Pushkarskaya on November the 27th know that I, with a group of comrades, spoke at the International Forum of Beijing on November the 16th, 17th, and I made certain significant statements for the first time to Eastern civilization, although the West was also present there, Americans, the British, the French, Germans, Canadians. There were also Japanese, Koreans were there. Two languages were spoken there, English and Chinese languages of the West and East. But I said that I represented a third civilization. Although there was no order who was the first, who was the second, I represented the Russian civilization. I could have read the text of my performance in English. Everyone had it on the table. There was a set of speeches, among which was my performance and the performance of Viktor Yefimov, who also spoke there. My performance was translated into English and Chinese, but I wanted Russian to be heard there. Therefore, I spoke Russian there, and one translator translated into English from the synchronous translation booth, and the other, the Chinese translator, I asked him to sit next to me. So, what was announced in Beijing? I will continue. Imagine, I had only 20 minutes, 10 minutes for speech, 10 minutes for translation. That is, they had to translate into English and Chinese. I rethought a vast amount after speaking there, then I saw the consequences of that speech. And my speech of today should have in principle been named as follows. How to break free of the sad legacy of Atlantis. This is much more serious than the civilizational triangle East-West Russia at a new stage of globalization. Today's meeting reminds me of a similar meeting on December the 21st, Stalin's birthday. Then there was the first all-Russian conference held in the building of the Polytechnic Museum where then representatives of those familiar with the conception of social safety gathered. Fifteen years have passed. Now I speak very rarely. This year this is only my third speech. I have to travel a lot and work even more. I want to start my performance by saying that today is an unusual day, December the 21st. Today is the birthday of Comrade Stalin. Recently there was a conversation on the theme Stalin left 2,000 tons of gold for us. I chuckled and said, and only this? He left for us a dream of the future. Because Stalin, of course, ran far ahead, a hundred years ahead. The society was not ready to go where Stalin wanted to lead it. Hence the hatred of all the liberals towards Stalin. Therefore, he is a murderer, he eats children alive, he shoots everyone and so on. Well, this is black PR. Well, today is such a turning point. Tonight will be the longest night, and from tomorrow the day will begin to get longer. In 1991, about the same day, when the USSR collapsed, or to be precise, was brought down, one of my comrades came to me and said, Today I received these lines of a poem in my dream. From the side whereon the map is night, the earth sleeps soundly neath the drift, from the deep snows a voice, clear, bright. I am not killed, it says, I live. For us, this is a certain signal that Comrade Stalin is still ahead. You know that there was that TV project called The Name of Russia, in which Stalin took the first place with a wide margin from others. This is why, out of a hundred declared as victors, Stalin's name was not included. But this tells the whole society that they are very afraid of Stalin. Later I'll tell you why. I say it again, fragments of what I'll tell you now, were announced in Beijing. Modern society reminds us of children. You know, children, after birth, when they start thinking, they believe that the world began from them. Then as they grow up, they begin to think, dad and mom, grandparents, what kind of world did they live in? They begin to understand all this, move further, 
reach in their thinking their great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers and some even reach older generations. And children who naturally come up with the questions, where do babies come from, begin to be told, babies appear in cabbage or storks bring babies, etc. So I will briefly outline, civilization has not yet come out of childhood. I'm talking about the entire civilization as a whole. It corresponds to the age of children, three to five years old. The only difference is that the role of telling them that babies appear in cabbage or storks bring babies is played by the Bible. When children ask, they need to be answered somehow. Speaking in Beijing, where there were Marxists and Trotskyists sitting, I saw Trotskyists alive at the international level. The forum in which I spoke was dedicated to Marxism and Socialism, although none of these speakers spoke on Marxism. Most of these speeches were devoted to the theme, Why did the USSR collapse? To which I said that people in the USSR itself know about it better, but not those who watched this process from the side. Marxism, of course, and I openly stated this, played its role in the 20th century. Thanks to Marxism, the world has changed. How it has changed is another question. I will not develop this theme now, but in order to understand what tendencies Marxism gives rise to, and how these tendencies will manifest themselves in the 21st century, in the 22nd and further on, it is necessary to understand the global historical process, about which there is no idea in society, because this theme is closed. I also said that in order for Marxists to understand all this, they have to abandon the cultic version of the global historical process, which on the one hand is described by F. Engels, and on the other, in the Bible. Our civilization may be the last one, but it is not the first one. Before us, there were other civilizations. Now there is already enough research and artifacts that speak about this directly and frankly. The previous civilization was an antediluvian civilization in which there were two races, a race of slaves and a race of gods. The latter lived much longer, and the biblical reports of the ages of 900 and 1000 years apparently have some basis. They created their own culture and the slave race perceived them in the quality of gods. But for some reason there was a flood. Nobody denies this, that there was a flood. Whether it was worldwide or whether it happened only on individual continents, it is unknown. It is only known that this happened as a result of a powerful geophysical catastrophe. We have our version about the cause of the catastrophe. When I say we, I mean the collective. Later, if there is some time at the end, I might tell you about this version, but here is what is interesting. We had in Russia a mystic writer by the name of Dmitry Mirishkovsky, who in 1917 intuitively understood this, and he wrote the book The Mystery of the Three, Egypt and Babylon. It was first published in 2001, the circulation was small. Before coming here, I reread it and wrote out small fragments in order that you understand. It is in fact about these gods of Atlantis, of whom the whole mythology of ancient Greece is comprised, and Mirishkovsky writes there about Egypt, ancient Greece, and Atlantis. There is the probably well-known to everyone work by Plato, Timaeus, where he talks about Atlantis. I will read passages from it, and passages from the Bible. Ye are all young in your souls, for ye have not in them, because of old tradition, any ancient belief nor knowledge that is hoary with eld. And the reason of it is this. Many and manifold are the destructions of mankind that have been and shall be. The greatest are by fire and by water. But besides these there are lesser ones, in countless other fashions. But in Egypt we are preserved from the fire by the inundation of the Nile, and from the flood, because no rain falls in our land. Therefore our people has never been destroyed and our records are far more ancient than in any other country on earth. Then the priest goes on to tell Solon, one of these histories, how that 9,000 years ago, Athens was founded by Athena, and a thousand years later, Sais was founded by the same goddess, how the ancient Athenians excelled all nations in good government and in the arts of war, and above all, how they overthrew the power of Atlantis. And why in Egypt? This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island, 
situated in front of the straits, which are called by you the Pillars of Heracles. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to other islands, and from these you might pass to the whole of the opposite continent, which surrounded the true ocean. For this sea, which is within the Straits of Heracles, is only a harbour having a narrow entrance. But the other is the real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a boundless continent. Now in this island of Atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others, and over parts of the continent. And furthermore, the men of Atlantis had subjected the parts of Libya within the columns of Heracles as far as Egypt, and of Europe as far as Tyrrhenia. Pay attention to this. This is from the book by Plato, Timaeus. But the run I read from the book of Genesis. Genesis 6 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. Now from Critias. But when the divine portion began to fade away, and became diluted too often and too much with a mortal admixture, and the human nature got the upper hand, then they, being unable to bear their fortune, behaved unseemly, and to him who had an eye to see grew visibly debased, for they were losing the fairest of their precious gifts. But to those who had no eye to see true happiness, they appeared glorious and blessed at the very time when they were full of avarice and unrighteous power. Zeus, the god of gods, who rules according to law, and is able to see into such things, perceiving that an honourable race was in a woeful plight, and wanting to inflict punishment on them. Further on, a quote from the Bible. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that have moved along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. Genesis 6, 5, 6, 7. The ends of both myths are identical for some reason. The Egyptian god says, Forever and anon there comes upon the earth a great destruction by fire or by water, and the people perish, and all their records and monuments are swept away. Only in the mountains survive a scattered remnant of shepherds and unlettered men, knowing naught of the past. And when again a civilization has slowly grown, presently there comes another visitation by fire or water, and overwhelms it. The Bible says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh. Genesis 6.17 But in later time, after there had been exceeding great earthquakes and floods, there fell one day and night of destruction, and the warriors in your land, all in one body, were swallowed up by the earth, and in like manner did the island Atlantis sink beneath the sea and vanish away. Wherefore to this day the ocean there is impassable and unsearchable, being blocked by very shallow shoals, which the island caused as she settled down. This is from Timaeus. And here are the words of Mereshkovsky himself. What is Atlantis? A legend? Or a prophecy about the future? Did it exist, or will it exist? Are Atlanteans sons of gods? Or as we say now, man-gods? And isn't the same end awaiting us as the Atlanteans? The Apocalypse describes the final phase of the biblical project that was recorded by the dictation of the Atlanteans who survived after the flood. So, slowly going down and becoming colder, we are approaching our beginning. Memphis and Heliopolis are closer to the future, more apocalyptic than all our modern cities. Stone needles of obelisks in squares of Constantinople, Rome, Paris, London and Washington are eternal milestones of the path of mankind from Atlantis towards the Apocalypse. The end of Atlantis is the beginning of Egypt. The end of the First World is the beginning of the Second. Is the Apocalypse the end of the Second and the beginning of the Third? Here is direct evidence from the early 20th century. Now let us think about it ourselves. Yes, some of those who were considered gods survived the Flood and ended up in Egypt. What do you think they had to do? What project were they supposed to implement? Exactly the same as the one they implemented in Atlantis? 
Did they understand why Atlantis had perished? They understood it in their own way. To be short, there are many versions as to why Atlantis perished. In my narrow specialization, I dealt with parametric resonance, which is characteristic of submarine hulls in their interaction with the propeller. For those of you who watch on REN TV channel, the search of Sklyarov in the pyramids of Egypt, Mexico and other countries, it was Sklyarov who began to show a lot about how the insides of the pyramids are arranged, and suggested that the pyramids, of course, were not built in Egypt. These are antediluvian structures, and the Shretzes of Atlantis were engaged in translating sound vibrations into infrasonic ones, since so-called waveguides were found in the pyramids. To understand what this is, take a piano or a grand piano, press the left pedal, and hit the high octave keys, and you will hear a reverberation in the low one. This is such a primitive example, showing what low frequency parametric resonance is. And so they, trying to obtain more and more powerful energies, but the lower the frequency is, the higher the power of the wave is, and arranging waveguides most likely, they reached the natural frequencies of the Earth as a whole. So they overplayed their hand. One can calculate the natural frequency of the Earth's oscillations as a sphere. It is on the internet, one can find it. It is about 0.3 MHz. When doing similar research on submarines, at frequencies of 3 to 5 Hz, the wavelength is 1.5 km. The power of the sound wave is such that it goes around the entire globe. If the Schretzes of Atlantis reached the resonant frequency, then the Earth answered them. The plates moved, and water has inertia. It simply washed away everything that was on these plates. The oscillation period is approximately 60 minutes, so think for yourselves. I say again, this is purely my version. By pure chance, I dealt with this in my narrow specialization, so I understand this. Sklerov himself did not even understand what he had raked up. The flood, of course, was not recorded, but the process itself seems to us as follows. I understand that everything I am saying now, one way or the other, will find its way to the internet. In Beijing I could not speak about this, although I already knew, and we had already discussed it in our circle. I did not find any serious objections, although there are many nuances. So, the project that the surviving Atlanteans began to implement is no different from the project they were engaged in in Atlantis itself, and it ends with an apocalypse. Later, when I talk about the Western civilization, about electronic fascism, I will explain what this means. I started reading the Bible at around 13, 14 years old. My great-grandmother told me of one thing that made me search for the Bible and read it. Some say that in Soviet times, it was impossible to find a Bible and read it. It was possible if one had such a desire. When I read Revelations, what is described in that part seemed to me to be an impossible fantasy. And now we have come to the final stage of the biblical project, which is supposed to end this way, with an apocalypse. In Beijing, I said that we are not against globalization, since this process is objective. We are against the conception according to which the West is conducting globalization. From the rostrum I said directly, just don't think that it was the Jews who managed to come up with this. This is not on their level, they are just executors, we are often reproached for wanting to take the Jews away from responsibility. For this project to be realized, it was necessary to create a powerful periphery, and they created it. Those who have read the Sinai Hike have to correlate the information that I am giving today with the information that is given in that work. I reminded in that audience, one could say that it was a global audience, that when a priest from the USA arrived in St. Petersburg in 1991, I could not explain to him what makes the words Jretz and priest different. Because in English there is only one word, priest. The concept of Jretz exists only in two languages, in Japanese and in Russian. And you know that a concept is an image plus a word code. If there is no image, then it seems that this phenomenon does not exist. And only when I told him that the Jretz speaks with authority, that his will is matched with the wisdom of heaven, while priests only interpret the scriptures, nothing more. I saw in his eyes that he had grasped it. Since there were Americans in the front row, I saw their reaction very well. 
There are actually three civilizations on Earth. Nikolai Starikov, whom I know personally, wrote a book, Geopolitics, How It Is Done. In his book, he talks about two civilizations, the civilization of the land and the civilization of the sea. And these two civilizations are constantly fighting among themselves for influence in the world. Where is their globalization here? The civilization of the land is China and Russia, and the civilization of the sea is Great Britain, the United States, and the war between them for influence in the world is constantly ongoing. If one poses the question, why are they always fighting? Then the answer will be something akin to the story of the three musketeers, where Porthos is asked the question, why do you fight? To which he replies, I fight because I fight. In his books, Geopolitics, How It Is Done, the answer is something like this. What do theories of governance have to do with it? And what does globalistics have to do with it? So the facts are the same, but the conclusions are different. In our view, there are three civilizations on Earth. The West, the East, and Rus, Russia. And there are not so many combinations. Either the West and the East are against Russia, or the East and Russia are against the West, or the West and Russia are against the East. That's it. There are no other combinations. China is the center of Eastern civilization, and there are very weak views on it. Few people know that at the beginning of the 19th century, China had a population of 410 million, and the gross product of China exceeded the gross product of the entire West, Western and Eastern Europe, the United States, although the source in which I read about this does not say anything about this fact, but anyway, this is a fact. Few people know that 150 years before the Great Discoveries, the beginning of the 15th century, which the Spaniards and the Portuguese began to engage in, mastering America, China had the most powerful fleet in the world. And Admiral Zheng He, who was raised to be an admiral since childhood, although he was a eunuch, in the 1410s he equipped a huge expedition, which in scale was much larger than the Spanish Armada, reached the shores of the Horn of Africa, the Strait of Hormuz, the Mediterranean Sea. But for some reason, upon his return, the dynasty changed. The next emperor ordered to disband the fleet, destroy all the records of Admiral Zheng He, and cleanse the people from the coastline ten miles inland. Confucius. We also have a vague idea about what Confucianism is. Confucius was a contemporary of Pythagoras, you know. In Greece and Egypt there was Pythagoras, and in China there was Confucius. And so they were contemporaries. China is not an ordinary civilization, about which one foreigner said, China is a civilization that pretends to be a country. And those Europeans who were there in the 16th and 17th centuries were amazed at the wealth of this huge country, at how trade between the provinces proceeded there, and all the provinces were connected by canals, rivers. And they said that if the whole Europe were united, it would be smaller than this whole huge civilization. I think that the emperor who disbanded the fleet wanted to shut China off from the world. Moreover, the Chinese had the following views about the world. China is the center of the universe. The Chinese culture is the best. And the countries that live nearby, Japan, Vietnam, Burma, Indians and others, as the Chinese say, are just lucky. But others live there beyond the seas and oceans, and they are very unlucky. They are very far away. They cannot join the Chinese culture. So Zheng He loaded all his ships with gifts. He came to this or that country, gave gifts, said that there is China, meaning come to China, and we will be glad to accept you, because by doing so you acknowledge that you are our vassals. What did the Europeans do when they discovered some land? They said, this is now the possession of Portugal. This is now the possession of Spain. The Chinese said, we don't need anything, we have enough of our own. And when the British were the first to come to China with new technical toys, they were not allowed to see the emperor. They were told, we don't need all this, we have everything. China doesn't know exactly when it came into existence. Its peculiarity is also in the fact that its system of writing is hieroglyphics. This is the writing of the right hemisphere of the brain, which allows them to read any documents that were written in the same language 4,000 years ago. The first 18 centuries, this is exactly the time of the dominance of the Chinese civilization in the world. And then, after the Opium Wars, 
another period began. China was not afraid of conquerors. When conquerors like the Mongols came, representatives of the Chinese administration explained to them, you see what a huge country we have, and you are very few in numbers. What do you want? Receive tribute? Well, for that you need to govern this country. Do you agree with this? If yes, then you must use our administration. And they used it. After a while, all the conquerors became Chinese. And only after the Opium Wars did first the British, then the French, Germans, Americans and Russians begin to work with China. Ah, the barbarians have come. We can make them Chinese, or bump them against one another. That is, you came to China, so fight each other for China. I will not tell you the story of the Opium Wars, but I will tell you a little about Confucius. I said that he was a contemporary of Pythagoras, 551 to 479 BC. Who is he? It should be understood that the history of China is cyclical. There, periods of turmoil, revolutions and periods of stabilization are constantly replacing one another. Our country is like an accordion. Every time it expands further. But they do not. It is the same. Expand, shrink, expand, shrink. So Confucius was not lucky. He lived in a period of turmoil. And turmoils last for a hundred or two hundred years. He wandered around all the provinces, offering his services to the princes who fought for power. But everyone refused him, so he died in poverty, leaving, however, the collection, Lun Yu, that is, the Analects. What is this? This is a type of Chinese Talmud. Mao Zedong studied Confucius very well, so whatever ideology is there, Marxism, Lamaism, and so on, the foundation is Confucius. His teaching was not about the salvation of man, as in Christianity, but about the salvation of the state. He explained that it is necessary to maintain a strict crowd elite social structure. That is, each cricket must know his heart and listen to the ancestors, then everything will be fine. This was called the path of Tao, adhering to which one could obtain a harmonious and previous society. In China there is no God. There is heaven and those who live on earth. The emperor has a special mission. He is the mediator between heaven and those living on earth. Therefore the emperor is the pinnacle of the world order. But all sorts of changes reach the emperor later than everyone else. The fact that the world had entered a new phase, technocratic, that the technosphere had begun to form, became known to him only after he was informed that Japan had already opened and begun the Meiji Technical Revolution, 1868 to 1889. And now the following. I have already spoken about the variants of civilizational alliances. So, with whom and against whom should we be friends? With the East against the West, or with the West against the East? What are the risks for us? How can we be used? So, in order to understand this, we must understand what is love. We must understand what love is in China, and what love is in Russia. You know, we have three volumes of the Fundamentals of Sociology, we hope, well, we hoped, that by the end of the year, or next year, we would definitely finish the fourth volume, where there will be a whole chapter devoted to the concept of love. So we have to understand the attitude towards love in the West, the attitude towards love in the East, and the attitude towards love in Russia. But first of all, I want to ask you all such a question. I ask my students this question. After all, I mentioned that there exist three civilizations. However, Starikov says that there are two civilizations, but not three. What is the main characteristic difference between one civilization and another? These are ideals. I ask my students the question, tell me, without getting scientific, are the ideals of the West and the ideals of the East different from each other? All in one voice they say, yes, they are different, of course. Then I ask the following question, are Russia's ideals different from those of the West? They think it first, then they answer, yes, they are different. Are Russia's ideals different from the ideals of the East? Yes, they say they are. Now let's think together, what is Russia's ideal? Putin is already indicating this. The ideal is praviousness. But you will say that in the West there exists the concept of praviousness. Yes, it does exist, but not the same as ours. Putin said that the concept of praviousness is a certain super-mundane idea, something stretching beyond the horizon. 
Можно небольшое уточнение? Просто мой вопрос был не только о американо-иранских отношениях, но и о американо-российских отношениях и наличиях, согласны вы с этим или нет, идеологических, фундаментальных противоречий по ключевым вопросам международного есть, права. Перед, перед встречей с Обамой вы меня прямо и так и толкаете. Ну, это же очень важно, потому что если страна считает, что ей позволено больше, чем всем остальным, то... Я думал, что вы не заметите. Нет, вы заметили. Вы действительно такой цепкий боец. Значит, у нас идеологических противоречий на сегодняшний день практически нет. У нас есть фундаментальные культурологические в основе американского самосознания лежит индивидуалистическая идея. В основе российского – коллективистская. Вот э, есть один из исследователей Пушкина, который об этом очень точно и ясно сказал. Вот в «Унесенный ветром», помните, там главная героиня, она говорит, что я не, не могу себе представить, что я буду голодать. Вот для нее это самое главное. А, а в нашем представлении, представлении русского человека, все-таки другие задачи. Это что-то такое за горизонт уходящее, что-то такое душевное, что-то такое связанное с, с Богом. Понимаете, это немножко разные философии жизни. И поэтому понять друг друга довольно сложно, но, но можно. Ну, для этого, наверное, есть международное право для того, чтобы стать а, ну, всем ну, да. Ну, вот, Соединенные Штаты, безусловно, демократическая страна и она развивалась изначально как демократическое государство. Ведь когда люди начали осваивать этот континент, они приезжали, выстраивали отношения друг с другом. И по, по факту жизни вынуждены были это делать в диалоге друг с другом. А поэтому она изначально рождалась как фундаментальная демократия. Вместе с тем, не будем забывать, что освоение американского континента, вы меня заводите прямо в дебри, мне не хочется об этом говорить, но освоение американского континента началось с крупномасштабной этнической чистки, которая не имела себе равных в истории человечества. А ведь европейцы, когда туда приехали, они этим и занимались, надо прямо об этом сказать. Она, не знаю, вот человечество не так много известно из истории, ну, скажем, уничтожение Карфагена римлянами, да, когда они уходили, они даже э, землю, так вот легенда гласит, солью посыпали, что там ничего не росло. А освоение американского континента европейцами, там землю никто не посыпал, потому что ее использовали, но уничтожали коренное население. После этого американская, американская история знает рабство. И оно так глубоко проникло. Ведь Колин Пауэлл еще в своей книжке написал, как ему было тяжело. Человеку с темным цветом кожи тяжело было пробиваться. Как он всегда чувствовал на себе взгляды окружающих. Значит, это сидит. Сидит наверняка до сих пор. В душах и сердцах людей. Ведь, ну, вот смотрите, мы знаем, во всяком случае, сегодня очень многие стороны советского режима. Знаем Сталина, да? Так, как раньше мы его не знали. Знаем, что это был диктатор, тиран. Я очень сомневаюсь, чтобы Сталин в весной 45 -го года, если бы у него была атомная бомба, применил бы ее против Германии. В 1941-1942 году, когда стояло, стоял вопрос о жизни или смерти государства, может быть, он применил бы, если бы у него было. А в 1945-м, когда уже противник все сдавался, по сути дела, шансов у него никаких не было, я сомневаюсь, вот я лично. А американцы применили против Японии терпящее поражение, причем против государ... неядерного государства. Знаете, вот у нас, у нас большие различия между нами. Но это ведь нормально, когда люди с такими большими различиями полны решимости искать пути, которые помогают понимать друг друга. И мне представляется, что у нас нет другого выбора. И более того... Ведь не случайно, что в критические периоды современной новейшей истории Россия и Соединенные Штаты объединялись и в Первую мировую войну, и во Вторую мировую войну. Вот как бы, как бы не противостояли друг другу, а когда вот гром грянул, произошло объединение. Что-то все-таки объединяет, какие-то фундаментальные интересы объединяют. Нам нужно... 
нам нужно вот на это обращать внимание прежде всего. Знать наши различия, но, но при этом все-таки обращать внимание на тот позитив, который поможет нам сотрудничать. That is why Confucius became, let us say, a Chinese brand, and his teaching became a type of Talmud. Because he, pay attention to this, he was a supporter of the refined crowd elitism that would remain unchanged throughout centuries. Then the state would remain. Now let's look a little deeper. Here is Confucius talking about love. There is the love of being benevolent, without the love of learning. The beclouding here leads to a foolish simplicity. There is the love of knowing without the love of learning. The beclouding here leads to dissipation of mind. There is the love of being sincere without the love of learning. The beclouding here leads to an injurious disregard of consequences. There is the love of straightforwardness without the love of learning. The beclouding here leads to rudeness. There is the love of boldness without the love of learning. The beclouding here leads to insubordination. There is the love of firmness without the love of learning. The beclouding here leads to extravagant conduct. You see, what is dominant is the love of learning. Well now, I will read the concept of love selected from folk wisdom in Rus. Think about it. Duty without love makes a person irritable. Responsibility without love makes a person unceremonious. Justice without love makes a person cruel. Truth without love makes a person a critic. Upbringing without love makes a person two-faced. Intellect without love makes a person cunning. Friendliness without love makes a person a hypocrite. Competence without love makes a person uncompromising. Power without love makes a person a violator. Honor without love makes a person arrogant. Wealth without love makes a person greedy. Faith without love makes a person a fanatic. So we are representatives of the Russian civilization. And what is the attitude towards love that Western civilization has, with which we now come face to face? Love with the capital letter is replaced by sex. And many of us have accepted this replacement due to the fact that Hollywood implemented it. We want to make love, and everyone knows what this is. Sex can easily do without love. A mother loves her children, and children love their parents, but they do not make love in the Western sense. The Bible imposes it from the beginning. Who read the story of Lot, where two daughters got their dad drunk and had sex with him? And the story with Noah is not very clear. And why is there nothing concerning his wife in the story about Noah? Was she not saved, or did he not have a wife? Then where did his children come from, Shem, Ham, and Japheth? And why did Noah curse Ham? If you carefully read this passage in the Bible, you will see that Ham was cursed because he saw one of the sons make love with his dad when his dad was drunk. However, there is information by announcement in the Bible, and there is information by default, which often negates the information by announcement. But I want to supplement the main thesis that I proclaimed, how one civilization differs from another. These are ideals. The ideal of previousness, God gave only one biological species on earth, the freedom of choice, and the ability to gain freedom of will. It turns out that it's impossible to cultivate freedom of will in oneself without love with a capital letter. And this has nothing to do with sex. A Russian person will never be happy knowing that unprivacyness is happening somewhere. A Russian person does not need the materialistic values of the West, does not need the dubious achievements of the East in the sphere of abstract spirituality, which has nothing to do with reality. The Russian person needs truth and he looks for it above all in life. To live according to the truth is the Russian way. In an unprivious social structure, when the minority parasitizes on the majority, the Russian person has no motivation to work. Here is an explanation for you as to why Russian people now work poorly and do not want to work. The Russian person works according to his sovest and free of charge if society has a dobro idea a previous objective. 
Measure is the essence of Russian civilization. Russian culture does not accept depravity. The West has replaced love with a capital letter, with sex. I have already said this. In light of what I have said, let us think about where everything is heading and with what cadre's base we can ingress from their tunnel scenario under the name of Apocalypse. The tunnel scenario is best described in the Chinese proverb. If you do not change your direction, you may end up where you are heading. The Bible is a tunnel scenario. There is no way out of it. Once again about China. We did not really understand why Mao Zedong needed the Cultural Revolution, but if one understands the specifics of Chinese society, when the period of turmoil, revolutions, fragmentation and unification interchange, then it seems to become obvious. The more intense the revolution of fragmentation, the faster the calm and time of cognition will come. In our terminology, this is called overregulation, to make it absurd. And Mao Zedong brought the Chinese revolution to the point of absurdity, because he knew Confucius well. All these leaps, which we attributed to the fact that Mao was out of his mind, but in fact it was not so. Mao wanted to end the period of turmoil fast and move on to the construction. And Deng Xiaoping continued his work, and now there is a period when China has united and risen up. Well now, about what may await us. There are two such cult writers, famous for many, Dan Brown and Umberto Eco. They are in some kind of confrontation. Dan Brown seems to cultivate that the final stage will take place according to the biblical conception, and Umberto Eco tries to expose him. All of you have read, or most likely have seen the movie, The Da Vinci Code. But few people know that the script was written according to a self-invention, according to one myth created by Pierre Plantard. This is a monk in France who wanted to get rich, and, living in one of the castles, began to promote the idea that he was looking for the treasures of the Templars. Some believed him and they began to give him money. Therefore, three writers, Michael Bajant, Richard Lee and Henry Lincoln, wrote Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. Because in his story about the Priory of Sion, there was no truth. Later on, in court, he admitted that he had invented it all in the 20th century. There was no Priory of Sion 2000 years ago. What is the main idea? I say this with confidence because in 1992-1993, the book Holy Blood and Holy Grail came to us in French. We found a translator, translated and published it. It was the first published in a number of 500-600 copies. We published it in 10,000, in a good hardcover, and someone bought all the copies right away. After that we published a thousand copies and kept them. Then we published only little by little. So what is the idea? And this idea, by the way, was later embodied in the film The Da Vinci Code, which was watched by two and a half, three billion people on earth. This idea is that Jesus was saved from execution, he had a family, Mary Magdalene was his wife, and he also had children. He arrived in Marseille, and all the royal families came from there. That is, all monarchies are linked by family ties, and their ancestral line proceeds from King David, and their ancestor was Jesus. This is the idea. If anyone remembers the film, The Da Vinci Code, what is the symbolist professor of history doing there? What searches is he conducting? He is busy looking for the heirs of Jesus Christ. The whole intrigue is built on this. Events take place in France, then in USA, Washington, and then in London. This is the first stage, the task of which is to pull down the historically established Christianity. Since it has fulfilled its mission, it is time to close it. What did Umberto Eco do? He has three very expensive, well-illustrated books. History of Beauty, On Ugliness, and History, A Theatre of Illusions. In the third book, History, A Theatre of Illusions, he actually reveals everything that concerns this issue, and presents how the myth was created by Pierre Plantard, who died in 2000. And only after his death did Dan Brown write first a book, then a film script. You know that nothing better than a movie will distribute this version. Now Dan Brown has written another book called Inferno. Internet users see Dan Brown. Inferno ads are constantly appearing. We are forced to read all this. And it is seen how the next wrapper unfolds. This is directly related to Atlantis. 
According to our estimates, at the time of Atlantis, apparently the population of Earth was no more than half a billion, 500 million. Well, you know that even in the 19th century, the population of Earth was just a little over a billion. And now if you read all sorts of, as they are called, conspiracy theories, you will see that many refer to the fact that 500 million is enough. A very narrow stratum of owner's gods, 490 million slaves is quite enough for 10 million owner's gods. This is where all this is going. In Inferno, for which a film script has already been written, and which, in Italy, is already being shot as a movie. The action takes place in Florence, then in Venice, and ends in Constantinople, Istanbul. Dan Brown knows how to pack any stories very well in beautiful wrappers. There are many galleries, museums, temples in Florence. Again, this American historian, a specialist in symbolism, is acting. And one of the protagonists there is an American who is engaged in genetics. And for him, Problem number one is the overpopulation of the globe. Seven billion, the eighth is coming. He studies how the population decline took place in history, in particular, how in Europe a third of the population was wiped out by diseases and so on. But he does not like such methods, so he solves the problem differently. He creates a vector virus. What does vector mean? This means aimed or targeted. Then he releases this virus commits suicide himself, and leaves a note. Someday humanity will erect a monument to me as its savior. In Inferno, he scientifically substantiates that if the growth of humanity continues as it is now, then humanity will perish anyway. And in this way, he says, I am saving it. The virus is aimed at making a certain category of people infertile. Within one generation, the world's population will decrease from 7 billion to 1, and then it will reach 500 million. But this is just the beginning. You already know that electronic credit cards are already the norm, and this no longer surprises anyone. Now we are preparing for electronic passports with bioparameters. And the final stage, when chips, which will actually contain your passport, an electronic credit card, will be implanted in a baby from birth, and this is complete control over humanity. In this case, what seemed fantastic in Revelations, that there will be a mark on the forehead or on the hand, and no one will be able to buy or sell anything, now it no longer seems such a fantasy. You, of course, can refuse it, but then you will be an outcast in society. So how then can we achieve eternity? Today we have the term, Converging NBIC, Technologies for Improving Human Performance, Nano-Biodigital Technologies. We have HUBI dealing with this, and the essence of this is as follows. In order to live forever, it is necessary to transfer one's own consciousness in digital form into a computer. And then it becomes clear that in the Bible, where characters are spoken of who lived for a thousand years or more, in general this is not such a fantasy. They will reproduce themselves the way that Galkin and Pugacheva are now advertising. In general, it comes down to a certain post-humanity. Do not think that this is some kind of crazy fantasy. A huge amount of money is aimed at this in the West, in America, in Europe. These are the ones that reproduce themselves in an unusual way. They are ready to become cyborg gods. It will be them who will be used and explained to that their consciousness will be transferred to computers, and on their basis, cyborg gods will be created and society will again turn into a race of slaves and a race of masters, but not the same as it was in Atlantis. This is the reason why the technosphere was created, and when this is completed, the sciences will be destroyed. When I began to read and hear about this, I thought it was some kind of fantasy. Nevertheless, maybe some of you have read the science fiction novel, written by Robert Anson Heinlein in 1941, Orphans of the Sky. I highly recommend reading it. The novel is about a huge spaceship that is being created on Earth. It consists of many levels. So people, governors and slaves, settle there. And they are flying to some kind of star, Alpha Centauri. They have many levels on the ship. They create agricultural land, and thus they feed themselves. But there is no science there. Their society degrades. And one of those who turns into an animal learns to count to ten. And only by chance, one gets into the navigator's room and sees that the ship is self-controlled, self-governed, 
and they had thought that the ship on which they lived was the real world. Suddenly he sees stars, and he allows no one to enter there anymore. We are flying. It is not clear where we are flying, but we are flying. Well, now what can this lead to? Now, in fact, there is not a single national government. Everything is under the control of the banking system. More or less, we can say that such governments exist in China, India and Russia, but they are heterogeneous. There are transnational elites who are trained, financed, and they give guarantees to some of the national elites that they will be allowed into this transnational elite. Well, if we talk about Russia, then apparently Chubais, Vexelberg, there are maybe two dozen people, and those elites that we consider national, they were given to understand that they have no chance. If a nation-state collapses, then the poorest and the richest become the first victims. The poor are deprived of social protection, and the rich have nothing more to steal, because if a nation-state collapses, then there is nothing more to steal. Everything already belongs to the supranational forces. And this is a very big problem. But there is a way out. The fact is, that in Atlantis, they did not make fuel. They simply had technologies on the basis of which, without a technosphere, they created everything they needed. Therefore, we do not see the remnants of that civilization. Now, if someone wants to transfer their consciousness into a digital form, a computer, to become a cyborg on a biocarrier, this will just be a copy. The copy and the original can never be identical. And further on, there will be degradation. Now, if we look at the elites in Russia and in the Western countries, the so-called developed countries, what do we see? How is the cadre's base formed? It is formed according to the tribal principle. One can get there only on the basis of family ties or on the basis of very good connections according to recommendations. Knowledge has no value. Everything is built on money. One should not think that this happens only in our country. It is the same in China, India, but there is a difference in China. So, let us recall what I said about love of learning. The translator, who accompanied us in Beijing, unexpectedly said, Well, here, the development of the cadre's base is a little different from our development. When he was asked how exactly this is arranged in China, he answered, referring more to antiquity than present days. Well, someone has a project. He comes to the emperor and says that the project is not moving on, but that he knows how to implement it. The emperor says, all right. That someone tries to implement the project, but he fails. The emperor asks, did you promise? He answers, yes, I promised. Then the emperor orders his head to be cut off, and he waits until someone else who can do it comes. Many of you have read our analytical note on the sacredness of power, yes? I spoke on the basis of that note at the seminar on November the 27th. We published it as a brochure. Let me just remind you that it was written because we began to be visited by those who asked us, also by secret services and agencies of the like. What do you think about the revival of monarchy? We said that we know about such variants. In the note of 1995 on possible scenarios for the development of events, we spoke about the monarchical variant. But it is unrealizable in our country and we explained why. We had to speak not in some fragments, but to present it in a holistic manner in the note. The concept of sacredness is concluded in the fact that if power possesses sacredness, then the representatives of power do not need to PR their projects. The whole society regards these projects as their own and strives with enthusiasm for their realization. Those who observe Russia, the USSR, they saw that sacredness of power collapsed long before the revolution took place. A revolution is a consequence of the collapse of the sacredness of power. And the monarchy of the Romanovs did a lot to make this power collapse. On November the 27th, I spoke about the trial of Vera Zasulich. In short, there was Emperor Alexander II, who abolished serfdom and corporal punishment. He issued such a decree a couple of years later, D.F. Tripov, the mayor of St. Petersburg, visiting the prison, saw one prisoner whose name was Bogolyubov. It seems that Bogolyubov did not take off his hat in front of Tripov. As a result, Tripov ordered 
that Bogolyubov be whipped. If Alexander II had somehow expressed a censure, in the sense that it was not good to violate his decree, maybe he would have survived. But the emperor did not react to it. As a result, this information that the prisoner, who was already broken, had been whipped, instantly spread to all prisons, and Vera Zasulich, the daughter of a nobleman, who at that time lived somewhere near Moscow, arrived in St. Petersburg, asked for an appointment with Tryapov, and shot him, but she did not kill him, only wounded. She was arrested. That was in November 1877. Well, three months later, there was an investigation. Tryapov recovered. A very famous, albeit young, 34-year-old lawyer, A. F. Kony, was appointed as a judge. The Minister of Justice, V. K. Plievir, began to put pressure on him. He insisted on a conviction and 20 years of hard labor. Kony replied that he would follow the letter of the law. There was a jury trial and the jury unanimously acquitted her. She was taken out of the courtroom by arms but they wanted to arrest her right there. However, she safely left for Germany. There she met Marx, Plekhanov. Later she herself condemned the terror, but the process was already underway. So if the government does not follow its own laws, then revolutions are sooner or later inevitable. What do we see now? Those who observed the processes in Russia saw that the monarchy had collapsed because its power was sacred, and they realized that the church was necessary because after the appointing to reign by church hierarchs, all the people, until a certain time, understood that this was power from God, and the one appointed realized projects as power given to him by God. Moreover, every emperor said, I work in the name of the people, but these bad nobles of mine are perverting everything. But the concept people is a collective concept. But again, those who observed the processes in Russia suddenly saw that the sacredness of power in Russia was restored. Whatever they write about Stalin, naming him a killer, assigning gulags to him, nonetheless, people worked with enthusiasm. Now the fact is unacceptable in the mass media, but the media does not belong to the people either. The media has never factually belonged to the people. But there is some but. 20 years after 1917, surveys were conducted. The question was on nostalgia for the past. Less than 1% felt nostalgia for the monarchical past, and that is not so much about the monarchy itself, as about how good life was then. Read I. Bunin, you will understand what this is about. Accusations against the people that they betrayed Nicholas II are stupidity. The people have nothing to do with it. Initially, the emperor gave up power, which in fact gave rise to a civil war. And the Tsar was overthrown not by the people, and not even by the October Revolution, but by the liberals. That they want a monarchy is concluded in the fact that they understand that they simply cannot return to the levels of power that they had before 2000. Nowadays, they completely control all the media. Putin has not a single newspaper, not a single magazine, not a single channel that would pursue the appropriate politics. It may seem incredible, but it's true. Putin is walking like on a razor's edge. The last conference demonstrates this. Since I understand that the question about the last conference will be asked, I should talk about it now. Do you think that Putin is a fool? Why does he, for the ninth time, hold such press conferences for more than four hours? What for? Well, PR and self-PR are external, but remember, Russia has been governed for a long time in an autopilot mode. But what is even more important is that governance is often carried out not by announcements, but by defaults. I always recommend not so much listening and reading as watching Putin. When Putin speaks, then one can see not only what he announces, but also what he leaves in the defaults. What is in the defaults? Well, you see that the system is ineffective, it doesn't work. This is the first thing. The system is not effective and I alone cannot work instead of the head of the municipality, village, council, district, city, region, krai. And when should I govern the country? And look who is in the audience. 1,300, well, how to put it more nicely, fools and idiots. This is the nicest expression. But this is a cross-section of the society. The subject or system of governance has to correspond to the object of governance. Putin does not have to be involved in educating the society. This is not his prerogative. He has to govern. And how can he show? Where can he speak about the fact that the system is ineffective? For the ninth time he shows this. 
Well, will you people wake up some day? Can't you see what's going on? And so that he is not blamed for manual governance, he denies his own acts of manual governance. For example, during a direct line, after contacting the president personally on certain problems, these problems are often solved directly during the direct line with the president. And results are reported immediately. What is this if not manual governance? And what about the local authorities themselves? What do they do? So from the point of view of the West, Putin PRs himself. Well, yes, he is the most popular politician of today. If one looks at all the prime ministers, chancellors, presidents, then in comparison with Putin, they just look like idiots. Bush, Obama, well, as primitive as can be. When they all gather in a crowd, they cannot say anything. They have nothing to say. We believe that Putin has something to say, but he should not say it yet. The whole society should be elevated. And as for Putin, he will do what he has to do. But some feel the danger, and therefore there exists the phrase, Putin go away. Well, okay, say Putin leaves, and then what? We have Ukraine as an experiment. Yushchenko, Yanukovych, someone else. And what changes if one person is replaced for another? Some are outraged that Putin will be in power forever. Putin will be in power, as long as it takes for society to finally wake up. And he's working for this, and has risen in understanding higher than the measure of understanding that is demonstrated by a hall of 1,300 journalists idiots. What questions did they ask? Was there at least one question of a state level? The Chinese woman asked there about the relationship between Russia and China. Putin replied in the style of, well, what do you want to hear from me? I celebrated my birthday with Xi Jinping, the president of Indonesia played the guitar there, and everyone sang congratulations to the president of Russia. Indeed, Putin has now risen above everyone. This is a resource, a very dangerous resource, very dangerous. Well, and since we touched upon the theme of the press conference, I understand that supporters and those who studied the conception of social safety have gathered here today. Everyone knows about the decision of the Lefortova court, at which the book Dead Water was included in the list of extremist literature. But this is not about dead water. Remember, this is about the war of the clans which are in the Kremlin, and those who want to take up the levers of governance again. On November the 16th, fragmentarily, but however it was stated in Beijing, that the conception of social safety in Russian civilization was created, and the conception is an alternative to the biblical conception of globalization. You know what kind of place this is. A half billion people. On November the 20th, 2013, Putin approved the conception of social safety. I immediately came up with the question, is this not a provocation? What kind of provocation? Do you think that Putin does not know about the conception of social safety? He knows, of course. Do you think that in his environment, there are no people who would come up with another phrase, not the conception of social safety, but something else? It is just a move. But what was written by the officials in the Kremlin is good intentions. While the conception of social safety of the internal predictor of the USSR is scientific methodological support of how to realize these intentions. Feel the difference. And we, I'm talking about my comrades, we waited. What move would they make? And they make this move. They know very well. And that woman from Lefortova court was explained to. They talked to her. She was told, what are you getting yourself into? Are you not afraid? The trial process began in April. It was necessary that there would be someone as an interested person. There are several societies here. But when she was shown the book Dead Water, she directed the decision of the Lefortova court to add Dead Water to the list of extremist literature. Then we made a statement to her and said, we are interested persons. There were 18 of them. To which she said, but we have no claim against the conception of social safety, we have a claim against Dead Water. When she was shown the cover of the book which said, the conception of social safety, and in quotation marks, Dead Water, then it became clear that the judge had not even opened this book. She knew nothing about it. On the basis of expertise? Well, I can order any expertise. They promised us to show the results of the expertise. And suddenly it turned out that even the secretary did not know that there had been a trial. In fact, there was no trial. The thing is that the laws that are created by creators are violated by these creators themselves. Therefore, Alexander Mosevich Polyev said the following for a reason. If there is a next revolution in Russia, it will be against the lawyers. 
They've conquered everything. So the Liberals made a move. They sent a request to the Ministry of Justice to list dead water as extremist literature. We were waiting. What move would Putin make? About a week later he made his move. Students of law faculties had gathered, and he, talking with them, as if by the way, says, And what is it with you all having such a desire for prohibition? Whatever appears, you prohibit it. Is it possible to prohibit something now in the age of the internet? By prohibiting something, one can only promote it. The history of the revolution says that as soon as the monarchical government prohibited something, it immediately became attractive, especially for the young people. Putin bluntly said, write something better, more understandable, more attractive, in the end more precise. But why prohibit? Просто, чтобы в сознании людей, пользователей интернета, провайдеров устаканились определенные правовые нормы и морально-нравственные. Видимо, для этого нужно время. Но это зависит от всех, кто в интернете сидит, кто пользуется интернетом. От понимания того, что, что от этого зависит будущее нашей страны в значительной степени, потому что ведь сегодняшнее и будущее поколение, воспитанные на, на интернете, все-таки немножко отличаются от тех, кто просто на, на книжках Тургенева воспитывался. Это чрезвычайно важная вещь. И от этого в известной степени зависит и будущее, будущее России. Поэтому, но, но просто свернуть это технологически, юридически, все запретить, абсолютно неправильно. Это самый простой и вредный путь. Это, это все равно, что, знаете, запретить статью, книжку. Ну и что? Это невозможно. Если она, по вашему мнению, является плохой, вредной, нужно талантливо, грамотно, своевременно ответить. С тем, чтобы потребители одной и другой информации могли сравнить и сказать, да, пожалуй, вот этот парень -то поумнее будет. А, а вот первое мнение, оно совершенно никуда не годится. Вредное, и нужно выбросить его на, на свалку истории. Ну, это так в общих чертах. Но подход в целом должен быть вот такой. Он, он должен быть... Это должны быть такие фундаментальные подходы, а не, 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 не сиюминутное желание задушить, схватить и не пустить. It is this kind of undercover clan war. And dead water has nothing to do with it. The thing is that they know perfectly well that the most creative part and the most thinking part of the youth is enclosed on it. Yes, we are not in the newspapers, the magazines or on television. Well, this is not surprising. And the fact that the court made such a decision, well, one should not be indignant. Those who are familiar with conceptual power and how real power in the world works know very well Conceptual power is autocratic. One cannot be elected there either for money or through any connections. Ideological power is formed on the basis of the conception. The biblical slavery conception is presented as a liberating one. Further on, on the basis of the conception, legislative power is formed. Laws are written. Executive power on the basis of laws implements this conception. The judicial power is obliged to protect its conception from the invasion of an alternative. And it would be surprising if, after so many years, the court had not made any convulsive attempts to prohibit. Too late, boys. You missed your boat a long time ago. Even more so, they ignore the fact the conception of social safety has passed the parliamentary hearings, and no experts, nobody understands who they are, nobody knows what kind of expertise they had. There were about 300 experts in the State Duma on November the 28th, 1995. All the materials of this hearing were there, one cannot ignore this fact. And the decision of the parliamentary hearings is such that the new composition of the Duma, the government and the president have to study the materials of the conception of social safety. This decision was signed by the chairman of the Duma, Rybkin, and no one objected because one can't get away from the fact. Judicial power in its status cannot be higher than legislative power. In fact, the current judicial power rejects the laws and leads to that which caused the trial of Vera Zasulic. What do you want? 
But there is one more thing, a much more terrible one. I know there are fellow Muscovites here. They want to remove dead water from the list of extremist literature. Forget about this list of extremist literature. It does not play any role in the age of the internet. Those who need it will find where and what to read. It should be about ending this list forever. The list is illegal. Read the second chapter of the Constitution on Rights and Freedoms. Everything is clearly stated there. But, as I said, there is another, much more terrible thing. They play with fire. What is more important in the conception of social safety in dead water? It is the sufficiently general theory of governance. Is everyone studying it? And why not? Because not only in Russia, but also in the USA, in Europe, no university has ever taught how to govern on a social level. This theme has always been a taboo. And suddenly such a theory appears. But what is dangerous for them is that any theory of governance generates a structure and architecture for setting and solving tasks of governance. What does it manifest itself in? The country whose leadership in its activities is guided and acts by a more perfect theory of governance. This country acquires sovereignty before anyone else. We propose to accuse the prosecutor's office and the courts of mafia conspiracy. Because such a ban is a ban on the study of the sufficiently general theory of governance, we propose to accuse the prosecutor's office and the courts of a mafia conspiracy against the sovereignty of the Russian Federation under the article Treason. This is how the question should be posed. If we pose it this way, we will see what will happen to our judicial power. After all, the fact that this is a mafia conspiracy is quite obvious. There was no trial, there existed document, and all this happened with all possible and impossible violations. Accordingly, those who manifested the initiative regarding the inclusion of dead water in the list of extremist literature, especially after its approval during the parliamentary hearings, committed a crime against the sovereignty and security of the country. They should be charged under the article of treason. This is how it should be posed. And here is an example with the vice speaker of the current Duma, Vladimir Vasilyev, who, speaking in the program Persona Grata, suddenly declared, Cheap labor is a competitive advantage of Russia. Here is an explanation for those who did not understand. The people should, as it turns out, receive low salaries and pensions, as a result of which the financial solvency will sooner or later be destroyed. All spheres of production working for the domestic market will become unprofitable and die. And what will be left of the country's economy in conditions of mass unemployment? That is, our employees will work for a pittance for foreign capital, realizing the practically content advantage of cheap labor. They are haunted by China's leap. Yes, there was a conspiracy for a certain period of time, accumulation of capital, well, like our NEP, the New Economic Policy. And Kissinger conducted shuttle operations during the reign of Nixon. Let us help you with technology, we will transfer our capital there. You will have the greatest profits, so we will solve the problems. What is there in China with the new government? The government there is beginning to develop its domestic market, beginning to raise wages and pensions. So long live the Stalinist policy of lowering prices. This was not a chimera, it was a reality. It is only the liberals who squeal about this. Well, and here is the last thing I would like to say. I am going back to my speech in Beijing. I went there to solve one more task. Maybe some of you know that somewhere in August, in September, there appeared an eight-minute cartoon named Forward Comrades. Zavalish,去上课了啊。啊。这是妈妈,是我们伟大社会主义的园丁,达斯维达尼亚。
妈妈说，并不是所有的人都理解支持我们的建设，但并不能否认它的伟大。我们的战士，神圣的信仰，永远都不会磨灭。它照耀着我们每一个人。抓到你了！贝利亚因为道歉、社会主义和人民的积木要受到处分，其他的同志都要引以为戒，保护我们的优良传统。Felix， 这是决战的最高指示，你要时时刻刻牢记，千万不能松懈。为了我们的上啊，妈妈这么早下班。不知道为什么，大家都变得很不好。老咪。不知道为什么，我突然想起了 Felix。这是决战的最高指示，你要时时刻刻牢记，千万不能松懈。妈妈，高科技的，是从美国运来的。对，还有这玩意儿，咱们以前都没见过。是这种像蚕丝一样，一看着就细，就是蚕丝的意思。这里面我要告诉你们。妈妈已经背叛了我们，他们都背叛了我们
It is a very unusual cartoon, where information is very densely packed into eight minutes, due to the fact that everything there is at the level of symbols. And this information relates to the following. In Beijing, during my speech, the Turks were present there, and they asked questions about my remark that in Russia, USSR, the coup d'etat did not take place in August 1991. It began on June the 26th, 1953, and lasted exactly 40 years, ending on October the 4th, 1993, with firing on the Supreme Council. The cartoon is related to this. What then happened on June the 26th? Well, you see that I've been talking now for almost an hour and a half. And there in Beijing, I had 10 minutes. How can one say what one wants to say within 10 minutes? Moreover, the translators had to translate me. But I was counting on questions. And the Turks asked me this question. They asked me to explain what the 40-year coup means. On this day, June the 26th, 1953, Lavrenti Pavlovich Biria requested a gathering in the Politburo in order to request the arrest of the then Minister of State Security, Ignatiev Semyon Denisovich. By that time, the coup d'etat was ripe, and those who had planned it, these are Khrushchev, Malenkov, Mikoyan, the coup was ready, but they wanted to carry it out quietly. And suddenly, Beria asked permission to arrest Ignatiev. Who is Ignatiev? He was such a bastard who also changed Stalin's security. So they understood that if Beria succeeded in what he was doing, he would pull all of them down. They simply had no choice. Either they remove Beria, or he removes them. What is done in such cases? In such cases, the one who wants to prevent the conspiracy is accused of this same conspiracy. August 1991 is a carbon copy of the coup d'etat of June the 26th, 1953. Then, tanks were also sent into Moscow, and Beria was declared a conspirator, an agent, and so on. On that day, in the morning, there was a meeting of the ministers in which Beria took part. He calmly went for his lunch, and his son Sergo stayed. Later, his comrades called his son, Sergo, there is shooting around your house, go there right now. He arrived, saw two armored personnel carriers, the windows riddled with large caliber bullets, on a stretcher under a tarpaulin, there was his dad. A guard told Sergo, your father is killed. His friends suggested that he had to escape to Finland, otherwise they said, you too will be arrested. Sergo said, if I leave the Soviet Union, I thereby admit that my father is to blame for something. He is not to blame for anything. They told him, then you will be arrested. He was arrested and kept in solitary confinement for a year and a half. After which Malenkov came to him and said, Sergo, now everything will be over. Tell me where your father's archives are. He asked him, why do you think that my father shared this information with me? Sergo really didn't know. He was already preparing to be liquidated in the same way that his father was, without trial or investigation. Remember, Lavrenti is not just Lavrenti, but also Pavlovich. The fate of Paul I and Biria are very strongly connected. Paul I was killed as a result of a conspiracy, slandered with mud, and they tried to blacken him in the eyes of the people. But this did not work. So the same happened with Biria. Beria was, of course, a brilliant governor, and this cartoon, in a symbolic form, says the following. A girl, as a symbol of the people, builds some kind of toy pyramid house and says, on the first floor, there is a poor pyramid house. Comrade Vladimir lives. We call him Old Me. The always energetic Felix and his friends live on the second floor, and Beria the duck on the third floor, and I live on the very top. That is... An anti-crowd elite state should be built like this. It has to rely on a very solid foundation of a conception with an ideology, but it should not be a slave-owning one. There should be a structure that protects this conception, and there should be governors of the highest quality, and everyone should work for the people. Further on, there is that episode with her mother passing, her face is not shown, and when she is passing with her hem, she destroys the toy house. Well, then this duck takes the roof of this pyramid house and begins to hide it. The girl runs after the duck, starts looking for it. That is, these are people who will look for Beria's archives. Although the cartoon is Chinese, it is not addressed to the Chinese, 
but to Russia, and it is called Forward Comrades. And the most interesting moment is when the duck rushes about and throws this red toy brick, well, that red roof. Red roof was the name of the Soviet intelligence abroad, and finally the duck throws it into a mandarin juice box, and mandarins are China's governorial elite. That is, a hint is given, Beria's archives, which you are looking for, are in China. Well, think about where Beria could hide his archives. He left some kind of testament, he was not a stupid person, but he did not expect that the members of the Politburo, like ordinary criminals, would kill him as an enemy, and declare him to the people as an enemy and as a traitor. In other words, what could have been blamed on them, they would blame on Beria. There was no arrest, no trial. Then they presented this fact to the members of the Politburo. And only then did the 20th Party Congress take place. The struggle against the personality cult of Stalin began. They are still afraid of Beria's archives in Russia, America and Europe. They are not afraid of these archives, only in China. I strongly doubt that a 24-year-old filmmaking student could make such an 8-minute cartoon. I have spoken to many in China about this. She was finally found. I posed questions to her. So we are waiting for an answer about the symbolism. Well, and what, as they say, will calm the heart? First of all, I want to congratulate you on the birthday of Comrade Stalin, whose authority is seen by the entire mass media. The more they slander him, the more his authority grows. But Beria's authority will also grow. The year of 2014, in this respect, will be really unusual and very favorable for Russia. Because everything that should be laid down, was laid down, in the past 2013. There is no other way out, dear comrades and friends, but to prepare a new cadre's base. The cadre's base must be prepared on the basis of the world's most effective theory of governance. More than 20 years have passed. Now we can say this for sure, we have this possibility. Nothing has appeared in the world, at least in open access. Wherever I have been all these years, whoever I have talked to, with the president of Mongolia, with the president of Vietnam, with the governing elite of Malaysia, and of course with the Chinese elite, I told everyone about this. We look to the future with optimism. The entire Western elite and our liberal elite look to the future with pessimism. Our liberal elite now has a light in the window. This is Khodorkovsky after Putin released him. Just think, one criminal was released, why such a fuss? They say he is not an ordinary criminal. He is a criminal nonetheless. He has committed a criminal offense. Or someone thinks he did 10 years for nothing. No, not for nothing. We just doubt that Putin had the resources in 2003 to put Kadarkhovsky in jail. I will not speak in this respect, but the decision was made not at Putin's level. Putin did not have such resources. That is, he could organize this whole thing with Kadarkhovsky in jail, but it's hardly possible that it was him who made this decision. Maybe I'm wrong, and if it was not he who made the decision to put him in jail, then it was not he who made the decision to release him. When Kharakovsky was released from prison, a plane was immediately organized for him, he was issued a passport, and he immediately went abroad. He is like Vera Zasulish, just the opposite. This is who Kharakovsky is. Whether he will engage in political activity or not is of little interest to us. Russia rests on three pillars. The first pillar is the idea of humanness. Because if we rise to humanness, the human type of psyche structure, then the idea of previousness will be realized automatically. The second pillar is the Russian language. And the third one, this is all of Pushkin's works. Pushkin laid the matrix for the development of Russia in Belkin's stories, the Belkin tales, where the final part of this matrix is in the story The Blizzard. The liberals' hatred of Pushkin is dictated by this. They know that he alone did what no one else could ever do. This is where I will end my speech today. Well, first of all, about Pushkin. Pushkin is the most mysterious figure of the 19th and probably the 20th century. Recently, Ren TV channel came to me with a request to record a program Pushkin and Freemasonry, 
Several times I have come across those who claim that Pushkin was a Freemason. Last year I made a special trip to Kishinyov. It turns out that there are a lot of supporters of the conception of social safety in Moldova. They even publish literature. So there was a very respected comrade who invited me for about two years, promised that he would bring me to the house where Pushkin lived in Kishinyov, even where he finished Gavriliada. I went there and do not regret it at all, because Gavriliada played a colossal role in the entire further destiny of Pushkin. Pushkin is indeed a very mysterious person. You spoke about the prophet. In my personal life, his verse, the prophet, played the most unusual role. In many videos I have said that I could not read the verse, the prophet, aloud. If my teacher of literature had turned out to be an ordinary person, he would have given me a bad mark. And then he would have forgotten, and I would have forgotten this. But my teacher sharpened my attention. I believe that Pushkin laid a time bomb in the verse, the prophet. What is this bomb? Tsar Nikolai Pavlovich recommended that Pushkin write this verse at a meeting on September the 8th, 1826. Pushkin had a difficult task, to fulfill the emperor's recommendations. The meeting with him lasted four hours, and it took the same amount of time for him to realize his own idea. What was the idea? Since the emperor had asked Pushkin who the author of Gavriliad was, Pushkin honestly confessed that it was him. And then there was a long conversation about God. The emperor said, don't tell anyone else about this. I do not know exactly in what vocabulary, but the Tsar said to Pushkin something along the lines of, you are attacking the Institute of Prophets, on which the church is based. So write something that would speak about your loyalty. How all this manifested itself, this is unknown. But he understood. He knew that each and every one in the biological species Homo sapiens on earth is given freedom of choice from birth. Other species do not have this freedom of choice. A mosquito is born a mosquito and dies a mosquito. A pig is born a pig and dies a pig. But a man is given this. But freedom of choice without freedom of will is unrealizable. In 1826, the population of Russia is 70 million. And the entire governing elite is not even a million, literally a little over a hundred thousand. Circulation of Pushkin's works is small, 3,000. Who are the first readers of Pushkin? His closest circle. And how does he relate to them? If I could wear an unobtrusive mask, so no one in the merry crowd would know me. To whom is this related? To his closest circle. He understood that sooner or later in Russia, everyone would be able to read and write. And suddenly someone, reading the prophet, just like me, could not read this verse aloud. I think I am not the only one, because my teacher told me that it was the same with him. So until the age of adolescence, this someone slows down and starts pondering. Why? Where is this from? I spent half a century, fifty years, solving the riddle of the prophet. How did I solve it? There are five words that block the speech function. Filled full of my will. That's it. But at that time I did not understand this. And actually, I did not understand a lot of things. Does Russia need a prophet? How many prophets are needed? There are so many of them in the Bible, and so what? The whole Russian people is a prophet. Read Dahl's explanatory dictionary. We only need to rise to this level, but not go down under the influence of Hollywood. American culture is being imposed. Both the leaders of Vietnam and China told me about this with regret. But their time is over. And the youth cause optimism in me. 20-year-old, 25-year-old young people. They do not give in. Not all of them, of course. But there is a certain group that does not give in to this. I believe in the youth of Russia. An excellent cadre's base will grow from them. And they will solve these problems in the 21st century. And the problems will be resolved. We will creep out. We will break free of the sad legacy of Atlantis. Read our book, Trotskyism is Yesterday, but Not Tomorrow, or The Sad Legacy of Atlantis. We have our own myths. I said that China also has its own myths. How can we check all these myths? Even if we start reading documents in Russian, if they are not destroyed, 900-year-old documents, 
an ordinary person cannot figure out. Therefore, is this just myth or reality? This is a big question. Now I will answer about the global project. There is a global project. It was not for nothing that I said I do not want to develop this topic now, although I could have said that the group that called itself the internal predictor of the USSR is actually doing what our distant ancestors for some reason did not do. In the person of Andrew the First Call, Russia was presented with an ultimatum on behalf of these survived Atlanteans, the global predictor, in the form of their biblical conception. Either you accept ours or give yours. And although Russia did not accept Christianity in the first half of the new era, it ignored it and did nothing. We believe we did what Russia was supposed to do a long time ago. What other global project do you need? Even more global, globaler, globaler? In the materials of the conception of social safety, all issues in the field of philosophy, sociology, economics, pedagogy, education in the broadest sense, are set out and considered in detail. What other global project is needed? Here it is. The problem is about mastering it. Now about the cadre's base. I've heard this question from many. Kurginyan asked me, 20 years have passed and where is it? I'm surprised that those to whom he asked this question could not answer. And Starikov asked this question, and Gvaskov, Divyatov. And this project does exist. Why do you all ask this question? And wherever you go, Latvia, Estonia, Moldova, Ukraine, the first question is, what is your attitude towards the conception of social safety? What is the answer? I personally know Zaznobin. But you have not been asked about Zaznobin. So nobody can express their own attitude. This is dangerous. This is because they all work for the alternative biblical project. And for us this confirms the thought that the conception of social safety is an alternative to the biblical project. What does global project mean? Is the Bible a global project? Yes, it is. It is global. Does there have to be an alternative to globalization? Yes. Has such an alternative been created in Russia? It is being created. And I convinced myself in the audience in Beijing that judging by the way that they reacted, no one stood up, no one objected, no one began to hold discussions. Then there was a banquet, everyone somehow constrained. Only one Japanese man came up and simply asked, Who is this wonderful translator that you have? I've never heard such English. Only he said something. And if this were all not real, these guys are toothy. They would have grabbed it, and so it would have gone. As for the cadre's base, the preparation of the cadre's base is underway. It was and is underway now. Although I am a private person, a lot is enclosed on me. You can't even imagine how many people in different high structures know about it. The FSB, the army, the State Duma. You know that recently, one deputy in the State Duma said, all laws should proceed from a conception. I will start working on a conception. So he is going to start, although everything is fixed in the parliamentary hearings. But this is not the main thing. In all power structures, middle-aged people, not older people, are ready. They are just waiting. Some from Gazprom and from the banking circles asked me what to do. Maybe forget about it? No, guys. Why forget about it? Wait. Society has to be mature for this. A position like, get out of the trenches, go ahead, tear your shirt from your chest, is not needed. This is not necessary. There is such a Russian weapon, on the quiet. In universities, among the youth, how will you see this? On the basis of what do you judge whether a cadre's base is being created or not? On the basis of the result, yes? Some youth groups are being created that are already working in local government structures, in the republics, in the regions. After all, the same Kurginyan, the same Starikov, they collect huge hauls of people, and so what? If they are removed from television, no one will remember them. I am an exception. Besides, now I go around places significantly less. I don't want it. And I only go because I want to find out what is happening in Moldova and Ukraine. So all this is being created on the basis of a social initiative. No one allocates any resources for this. In Azerbaijan, Latvia, Estonia, there is a social initiative everywhere. Do you know that a new youth policy has been registered in Europe? These are Russian people who live in Germany, in France, Belgium, Holland, in almost all countries of Europe. 
and it's registered based on the laws of these countries. And those young people are eligible for grants and have the right to hold conferences. This year, only in Brussels, they have held two conferences. Is this not a result? And training a cadre's base is not such a simple matter, otherwise we will get liberals in the movement who will mimic and adapt. Therefore, it's better to do this without any noise and officialdom. We don't need to go to all these protests and things alike. This is a waste of time. This is not the way out of the trenches. It means digging ourselves into new trenches. So the process is underway. I do not have pessimism, like many of today's patriots. I conversed with Leonid Ivashov for two hours. And after talking with him, I really did have pessimism. Listen to that nonsense he says. Let's create a militia. And what? With the banners in the hand, we will go to the Kremlin? The process is going the way it should be going. I'll start with the latter. There in Beijing I made a statement. Thanks to my trips to the countries of Southeast Asia and China, I know that everyone complains that Russian is not being studied now, only English is being studied everywhere. But Russian was studied beforehand. I said then from the rostrum that many are now talking about the technological paradigm. The technosphere was created by the West. The West is English speaking. All documentation on all kinds of computers, electronics, is in English. But the sixth paradigm will not be technological. It will be mainly worldview methodological. Nobody forced anyone to learn English. It was just an objective reality. The sixth paradigm will be worldview methodological. And this is most adequately presented in Russian. That's where they were shocked. And I responsibly declare that in 10 to 15 years, the world of thinking people will speak Russian. Moreover, I have already spoken about this. In Canada, they created a methodology and wrote a very serious book on very rapid mastery of the Russian language by native speakers of English, French and so on, within one or two months. Immediately I received requests from London in order to contact this person. This is an expansion of the Russian language. As for Stalin, we have information that Stalin's corpse was replaced. How reliable this information is, life will show. I think it is also connected with Beria's archives. Pushkin's corpse was also replaced. There is no corpse in Sviatogorsk monastery. Natalia Nikolaevna did not go to the funeral service and did not go to the monastery because the coffin was just put in the tomb. When they opened it for the first time, 50 years later, there were bones that did not belong to Pushkin. The same question concerns the body of Jesus. The question is, who needs a corpse and why? For what actions? This reformatting of Russia today scared the liberals so much that they started saying that Putin was creating a new international. Those who are hysterical about this do not realize that the international was based on a certain conception of Marxism as materialistic atheism and a particular continuation of the Bible. I would ask them a question. On the basis of what conception can Putin create an international again? Well, my personal attitude towards this is the following. If we look at attendance, then the most visited sites are pornographic in the first place, which means that the majority of users are people with the animal psyche structure. In the second place is gambling sites, that is, they are zombies. The question is not about sitting in the trenches or about aggressing from the trenches. We have always been open to everyone who came to us. I said that one of Stalin's problems, it's not exactly that the project collapsed, I already said that Stalin of course was far ahead. The society was not ready. This is the problem of educational standards. I asked my students a question, tell me, without revealing at the moment of the question what exactly I understand by educational standards, tell me, I say, are the educational standards of monarchical Russia and in the USSR and modern Russia the same? Everyone says of course not. They are different. How are they different? They say, well, now there are more subjects, disciplines. I say, these are not educational standards. And no one, it turns out, can say exactly and definitely what they understand by educational standards. It turns out that no one among the students can say it. Of course, educational standards cannot be formulated just like that. 
And they did not change, either in monarchist Russia or in the Soviet Union, because they are based on, this is very difficult for an unprepared person to understand, what we call ultimately generalizing categories. We have biblical science, and by strength of the fact that the erroneous ultimately generalizing categories are taken as a basis, we have a dead end in physics and many other sciences. So, when I spoke in the European Parliament in September 2010, then I openly, I understand that there were representatives of all European countries sitting there, I openly said that there is a crisis in the five main sciences in all universities of the world, in the USA, Europe, Russia, China, and so on. Philosophy as a branch of science, sociology, history, psychology, economics. There is a dead end in these sciences. I said this in China, Beijing. There are students in the United States who are on strike on the theme of why do you teach this nonsense to us? Therefore, we focused our attention on sociology. Three volumes have been written. Those who have read understand how serious this is. At the meeting in Beijing, I was approached by a Chinese man who spoke Russian quite fluently. And when I asked, how do you know Russian so well? He replied that he had studied in Moscow State University at the Faculty of Sociology. I asked him, your professor was Dobrinkov, right? Smiling, he said yes. He asked me about my attitude towards Dobrinkov. I waved my hand, and he did the same. I told him, soon you, since you understand Russian, will receive three volumes of sociology. Well, all this is included in the cadre's base. All science is tailored towards the Bible, created from the standpoints of the Bible. Science is a part of culture. Culture is secondary to the conception. Have you ever thought about why the wording, this is not scientific, appeared? I personally talked with Yevgeny Anatolievich Akimov when he was alive, talked about Torsian fields. The entire scientific community screams that this is not scientific, it's pseudoscience. I would say that this is not biblical, or this is science, but another one, against the Bible. Let me explain why. While studying at a Suvorov school, I used to read the magazine Technology for the Youth, and there I read a fictional story about how some engineer, it was 1956, as soon as TVs appeared, assembled a TV in the garage, turned it on, and suddenly received an online picture not from our solar system, but from another galaxy. Thought number one, what about the speed of light? How is the transfer carried out? This is not possible through electromagnetic fields. That was the impulse. Well, further on, many things happen in the story, I will not retell it. If now, the technosphere that has been created makes it possible, the prohibitions are suddenly lifted, there are gravitational fields, electromagnetic fields, and television is built on the basis of Torsian fields. I would not be surprised if we get an online picture from some planets from another galaxy. But how does Hollywood present all the aliens that fly to Earth? This is also one of the tunnel scenarios. They are shown as aggressors. If we are observed from there, then they understand that humanity with such internal aggression should not be allowed into the circle of other civilizations. All these films about aliens' aggressors are a mirror into which we look which has nothing to do with real civilizations of aliens. But if suddenly something that Yevgeny Anatolievich and I dreamed of in 1993 is created, everything will be revealed at once. A completely different life will be shown, and that supranational power structure can collapse overnight. They are afraid of this. Therefore, this is not scientific. I have already said what tunnel scenarios are. Space flights, which our scientists rave about, even within the solar system, in 1972, when the Apollo project was launched, I was then at the Siberian branch of the Academy of Sciences. There, there was a discussion about the fact that life is protected perhaps only in the presence of Earth's magnetic field. Outside of it, life is impossible to protect. Personally, I think that the entire Apollo project was properly done in a studio. And if our leaders knew about it, then it was like this. You have the first person in the cosmos, and let us have the first person on the moon. Okay, go ahead. Anyway, you won't get to the moon. You see what I'm talking about. And flying into deep space is insanity. Transferring mass, matter, to other galaxies on rockets is insanity. The time will come, and they will say, we are crazy. Polynesian catamarans are more reliable when they transport household items, people. If you carry 20 tons of cargo to the moon, 
It is not a fact that you will return from there. Do you understand what I'm talking about? This is exactly the tunnel scenario that I'm talking about. It is also associated with the energy side. They are connected, space flights and energy. All power plants on the globe generate two hundredths of energy. Hydroelectric power plants, thermal power plants, high tides and low tides, solar and others, from atmospheric electricity as direct current, which is produced by a natural capacitor, condensator, called Earth. It is given to us from above. The question is, how to take it? The fact that Tesla was able to connect to it, and his car drove for almost two months without any energy, says that this is possible. If one gives energy to everyone, then how to govern them? After all, now all of humanity is being driven into megapolises, cities. Why? Easier to govern. In cities, society is degrading. Speaking for the second time in the European Parliament, I said, Are you not afraid that humanity may perish within two to three generations? I told them about the experiments of Nikolai Petrovich Dubinin, which revealed the fact that the city is a powerful mutagenic factor. Moscow, Petersburg, are the most terrible cities. Those who live in these blocks of apartments, children there become degenerates. Europe is one continuous city. That is why there are so many people with Down syndrome there. I said this directly from the rostrum at the European Parliament, and I didn't hear any objections there. This is what threatens humanity. But these Downs, or semi-Downs, are given mechanisms, devices with powerful data. Previously, there were simpler cars, so if someone with Down syndrome was drunk, he could hurt only a few people, but now he could have a jeep with 500 horses under the hood, not three like before. And what happens, you see? He swerves into an oncoming lane, kills everyone who is with him, and so on. This is where the problem is. The vector of objectives prescribed by the biblical conception. As yet, there is no other one. Yes, I have read such versions, but the problem is not about this. The problem is about something else. When Chernobyl happened, they rang the bell over all the world. And you see how quiet they are now about Fukushima. The problem is about this. This means something. I especially went to Ukraine more than once and talked with people. You see, the Maidan, what happened in Kiev is not so much for the Ukrainians as for us. Guys, never do this. There is no need to do this. Nothing is decided there. One imbecile is removed, another one is assigned. And those who are on the Maidan will not be given power. Now what can happen? The most likely scenario is a collapse after all. The western part with 10 million will be given to Poland, since they are completely heedless. Well, in the eastern part, there are statements by the mayors of some cities in the eastern Ukraine. If they show up here, we will give them a lesson. Because western Ukraine lives on subsidies from eastern Ukraine, and we do not want to feed these idlers. They have been hanging around on the Maidan for a whole month. After all, people have families, children. The students have stopped their studies. Well, one has to be an imbecile to do that. The written questions are over. In Deadwater, we have an analysis of the Mahabharata. You just haven't read it. Do we have to use it in every analytical note? I don't measure it in percentage, but we give quotes from various sources in order to confirm or deny some postulates. I think we've talked enough about this. I have Agni Yoga in four volumes on the shelf. I went to India to see what India is. I became convinced that the caste system of India and the Vedic culture in general are refined fascism. Do you want this kind of fascism that they have there? We have many people who like to jump around the streets and shout Hare Krishna. We have it, we have freedom. Shout Hare Krishna, who is stopping you? I'll tell you more. Mein Kampf with commentaries is published in Munich. We say to our liberals, publish dead water. If you don't like it, publish it with your comments. We live in such a world where one can always find a connection with any events, if one wants to, and in the name of some objectives. I understand that questions about Ukraine continue. 
Personally, my opinion is the following. Russians live in Ukraine. I still believe that there exists no state of Ukraine. Well, let's just see. Ukraine bans the Russian language. But textbooks in the university are in Russian. It is difficult to set out complex mathematical, physical and other questions in Ukrainian. The same is happening in Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. Moreover, these countries, these peoples began to be known only when they were a part of the USSR, in a cultural, scientific, whatever relation. Therefore, I do not see any trick here, and I would not connect Khodorkovsky to Ukraine at all. This is a special case. I listen to Echo of Moscow radio station because it's necessary to know the enemy by his face. It should be noted that this is just a bunch of crazy people, and they just proved, thanks to the story of Khodorkovsky, that they have all lost their minds. There are no more problems in Russia except for Khodorkovsky. My opinion on this is that the crimes of Khodorkovsky and Lebedev have been proven. All the materials on the cases have been announced. I cannot say that this is some kind of setup. On the contrary, I believe that for such crimes in the days of the USSR, when the death penalty had not yet been abolished, Khodorkovsky would have been put up against the wall. He should be thankful that he does not live in the USSR. And not only he. In China, they also have capital punishment. There, people like Khodorkovsky are periodically put to death. And Khodorkovsky and Ukraine? Well, of course, if one rakes around, one can find anything. Putin said quite sincerely that our Russian people live in Ukraine. And these blockades with prices, they also hit the average person. As for the oligarchs who live there, are they going to have a worse life over there? They will just steal more and that's it. After all, what does Putin say? He says, If you have already become independent, then not only declare it, but also prove that you are independent. Why do we sell gas to Europe at more than $400 per cubic meter, and to you $230? Moreover, Europe accuses you that your products are cheaper than in Europe. Yes, I once said, and we have it in an analytical note, that Snowden is himself information. Andrew the First Cold came to us in Rus. He came with an ultimatum, but he did not understand that he had come with an ultimatum. Those who sent him understood this. I do not think that Snowden understood anything in globalistics, but he is a certain message from the West to us. And so what about showdowns there between the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers? And Putin reacts correctly. He did not meet, did not work with Snowden. Call him an SNB agent, a CIA agent, it doesn't matter. In this sense I mentioned Snowden. He is also a message. Messengers in this sense are always to some extent of the zombie type of psyche structure. What does Putin say? He says, how did he decide to take such a step? After all, Putin himself was also an agent of intelligence, and he knows that there are no stupid people there. The Holy Spirit is the guide into all truth. As soon as the companions of Jesus lost this Holy Spirit, after all, not only Judas betrayed Christ, all of the apostles betrayed Christ. Actually, such questions are particular questions. They need to be answered for a long time. One cannot answer them in a nutshell. I know that there is a spirit and a soul, and that they are two different things. Read Chuchiv. Fyodor Ivanovich wrote this way. The soul is a dweller of two divided worlds. That is, there is a certain otherworldly part from somewhere, and there is a common for all world. But a whole lecture should be given concerning this. When it understands the difference between the types of psyche structures. Do you think that many people understand this? We are accused of dividing people. We didn't divide anyone. There are many things in the world, phenomena that really exist, but they are not described, and so it is as if they do not exist. We take onto ourselves the labor of describing and giving a certain lexical form to what objectively exists, but is not indicated in any way as if it does not exist. Global conceptual power has existed for a long time, but there was no adequate name for it. They, behind the scenes, and so on. Therefore, humanity will reach the human psyche type when it works in this direction and gets rid of non-humanness in itself. What is the problem? Many people know about the conception of social safety, but few know the conception of social safety. There is one more thing. Some comrades deceived themselves and their entourage by the fact 
that it is possible, without changing anything in themselves, to take the conception of social safety and, as if with a sledgehammer, beat people over the heads and thereby change society. No, the water has to rise from below, as in the soil, until it rises to the roots, to the very sprouts. And we were originally aimed at this. Moreover, we asked at official meetings that we not be messed around with for 20 years. Why? In order for the process to become irreversible. And we see that our agreements were respected. Exactly 20 years later, they started to go at the headquarters of the conceptual party Unity. But I warned about all this. No, not at all. Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin was against zombifying. I often have a dispute with the Freemasons about whether Pushkin was a Freemason. Freemasons claim that he was a Freemason. I say, okay. I ask, did he go through the initiation system? Yes, they say, he passed for sure. I say, if he passed the initiation system and became a Freemason, he would not have written what he wrote. You guys didn't hit the spot. Yes, he visited the Masons. They didn't want to tell him all the secrets, to which he answers something like this. If you don't want to, I'll figure it out myself. They called him a black monkey. He answered them. Two monkeys, chests of gold, a lot of fine expensive chocolate, and a fashionable malady, the same one you caught recently. The Bible has its own sociological doctrine. Karl Marx blocked the problem of usurious interest. This is the doctrine. No society of previousness can be built on the basis of Marxism. Did Marx understand that he was creating a secular version of the Bible? I think not. But here one has to take into account the following. I saw the apartment in Brussels where Marx lived and wrote the manifesto of the Communist Party. Once it was written, the world's leading newspapers published it in multi-million copies at a time. We brought to Beijing a project of an alternative financial credit system. Everyone is very concerned about their independence, although there are no independent countries. We propose, without losing independence, to create a center. Because this question of squeezing the dollar out of life, this is connected with the answer to the question asked. And to create a certain bank where each country can buy with its own currency and sell with the currency of another member of the deal. That is, everyone will remain with their currencies. Since, based on the dimensionless financial credit system, this is all clear. We wrote an analytical note 25 years ago, but it was not understood. We disseminated it, I still have a pile of its copies at my house. There we theoretically substantiated everything. If there are 10 of us, and if each of us has $1,000, then what is a dimensionless financial credit system? We divide the entire amount of 10,000 and get one. And from that moment on, each of us has one-tenth of the solvency of this nominal one. But if someone out of ten, like the United States, starts typing and throwing in denominators, then if you go into the office and steal from the safe, this is theft. And in our case, it is a very deliberate theft, organized a hundred years ago. The Federal Reserve System was created for this. To plunder all countries, but in such a way that they do not understand this. Did I make it all clear? But I'll tell you that 25 years ago, they looked at us and did not understand. The dimensionlessness helps to understand. In my job, I wrote a dissertation on military shipbuilding. In non-stationary processes, it is necessary to remove the dimension in order to determine. We simply applied the well-known method of dimensionlessness, but in relation to the financial credit system. But here everyone should understand. You take a loan, you don't ask others, you add more to your solvency, and in fact, without asking others, you make them poorer. But they don't know about it. That is, it would be fine just to take a loan, but a loan with interest, that is what kills. If this problem is solved, then breakthrough technologies will go by themselves. Now there exists a global task to restrain the development of science. You heard what I said. As soon as they solve this problem at the final apocalyptic stage, they will stop all sciences. What does this is non-scientific mean? This biblical system says, your discoveries are not allowed in our system. That is, in the biblical system, 
breakthrough technologies are blocked. So the whole question is how quickly the conception of social safety will be a breakthrough technology. And this is connected with the dissemination and teaching of the Russian language. At the beginning of the century, this was clear to someone. That is, as soon as two hundredths of the total, if even two tenths, the Africans, Chinese, Russians, will receive so much energy that it will not be necessary to burn oil, gas, coal and so on. But this is not the main thing. The people will scatter all over the planet. And these cities, megapolises, will be empty. If I have electricity, a car, I can build a road, a house, all this will be available if there is electricity. The whole question is how effective the system of using electricity will be in such a case. Such technologies already exist. So, such technologies will be blocked in the most severe way so that people do not run away from megapolises. Why were villages destroyed? Because the entire gene pool was stored there. As the Russian proverb says, every city is a faith, every village is a measure. Everyone says that we need to restore the village, but the strategy to destroy the village began in Soviet times. T.I. Zaslavskaya did this. Now it is already difficult to stop, but in principle it is possible. We suggest landscaping estate construction. We have a large youth organization that deals with low-rise construction. And in 2008, when Medvedev, apparently deciding to PR himself, said, This is the project of the future. Let us support this project. We rushed, gathered young people to Nizhny Novgorod. I hosted this forum, but nothing happened. Do you think they don't understand this there? They understand, but they are not independent. And there is this whole allow, not allow thing. No, this cannot be allowed in Russia, then everything will come to an end because it will be difficult to govern. After all, children will be different, much better. Because I say again, the city is the strongest mutagenic factor. If a child does not interact with nature, if he lives in a house surrounded by asphalt, with no trees or animals around, nothing. But Russia is an unusual country. I have already said that from Kamchatka to Leningrad, only in Russia, due to the vast territory, people have a second house, a garden plot. Why are there such obstacles with registration now? After all, it could be done quickly, and we have a lot of land. Russian cities occupy only 1% of the total territory of Russia. The Japanese will never forgive the Americans for nuclear bombings. The Japanese, regardless of their government, are people who do not forget such things. Japan is now an occupied country, you understand. But there will be a blowback, I have no doubt about this. Frankly speaking, China has its own accounts to settle with Japan. The Chinese also won't forgive the Japanese for many things. The Customs Union is an attempt to restore the USSR. In every former Soviet Republic, the ordinary people and the elite are already convinced that it was better in the USSR. The ordinary people lament. You know how many Uzbeks work in Russia. Whoever you talk to, everyone says that yes, of course, it was better in the USSR. But who will allow us to return to the USSR? Now the question is, how can this emotional state be turned to the creative stream of return? It was easy to pull down the USSR. 67% or 72% voted to keep it. Who voted? The ordinary people did and the elite crossed it all out with one stroke of the pen. The elite was what, considering the ordinary people? The elite just destroyed the USSR, and then the people did not believe until different national currencies were introduced. As soon as the national currencies were introduced, everyone understood. Yes, now we live in different countries. Therefore, the customs union is only the first stage. See how easy it was to destroy and how many attempts there are now to unite again. But the Americans know very well that as soon as Russia, Belarus and Ukraine unite, I'm not even talking about Kazakhstan, the rest under the pressure of their own peoples will immediately run to unite. The United States will do everything to prevent this. And we need to work to achieve this. The USSR was unique in its own way. And this uniqueness, as people in other countries saw it, was in the endeavor towards living a better life. 
Now what? In Spain, 60% of young people are unemployed. In Portugal, 35-40%. to 40%. In Italy, 25-30%. to 30%. There aren't any workplaces for the Ukrainians in those countries. There is already enough unemployment there. Everyone judges by the Maidan. You know yourselves that Moscow is a huge city. The task of the mass media is to show not what really takes place, but to show what they want, and create the illusion among people that this is reality. Like in the situation with a bunch of gapers and some onlookers that gathered on Balotnaya Square. There are always people who have nothing to do, just to gawk. And 12 million, the official population of Moscow. So is it really a million demonstration? In Kiev they say a million people took to the streets. There were not a million people there. People were brought there from western Ukraine, where the whole kitchen is paid for. Well, why am I telling you this? You yourselves understand all this no worse than me. And again we come to the conclusion that people should quit drinking. Still, it's time to think with your own head. Do not wait for someone to come and do everything. But what is this attitude to Putin as to old man Khatabich? Why should Putin think instead of everyone? Are we all not people or what? After all, he essentially makes it clear. I am a person like everyone else. Can you imagine Yeltsin talking like this for four hours straight? I don't think so. But you also cannot imagine either Merkel or Obama or any F. Hollander doing so. This is impossible. The only question is, why does Putin do it? He does this to show that the system needs to be changed. It is ineffective. But we are faced with the fact. The correspondence of the system of governance to the object of governance. If the object rises in understanding, then the corresponding system will appear, but not vice versa. The process of globalization has been ongoing exactly as long as humanity exists and will be ongoing. This is an objective process. The only question is what conception will it follow? It's very simple. Living under the dictatorship of Sovist is very difficult. When we describe the types of psyche structure, we said that there are instincts, habits, intellect, and there is also intuition, and there is God's guidance. Now we say the same thing, but we add that there is also Sovist. This is the innate religious sense. And every person, when he does something wrong, even if there are no witnesses, if his voice of Sovist is not drowned out, then he feels very uncomfortable. You see, there is no concept of losing the sense of Sovist, since Sovist is an innate religious sense, on the basis of which a connection is established with the supramundane reality, with the supramundane governance. And with an obsession, it is easy for a person to do something wrong, there is no prick of Sovist. Well, this many people do not understand. It is about the language of life circumstances of each person. Each person has a different language. If a person is heedful towards the language of life circumstances, then he can figure out exactly how God speaks to him. Then he will definitely read the warnings so that bad events will not happen. And no matter how the person avoids something, if the person is heedless to the language of life circumstances, even when something bad happens to him, after conducting a retrospective analysis on the chain of events that led to the current state, the person will be able to find that he was warned against what happened to him. This is not a universal language, since God speaks to everyone in the language of his personal life circumstances. This makes the church furious, but what can it offer? It can offer only one thing. God can communicate with you, only through us, but not directly and you need to pray only in church. And they constantly push at us, saying, you are against the church, you want to destroy the church. Why should we destroy the church? The church is a business project, a very ancient one. It has a lot of money. Its task is to interpret the scriptures. Well, keep on interpreting if you have nothing else to do. And we say that this is the conception of globalization. But what kind? The conception of Western technocratic civilization. And no matter how much orthodoxy is fenced off from Catholicism, there are some peculiarities, but this is not important. It is important that they are under the Bible. Now it is quite possible, we see this from the statements of the patriarchs, 
that they will try to revise, kind of retranslate the Bible, and perhaps throw out the sociological doctrine of usury, maybe they will introduce some apocryphal gospels there, but this will not change the essence. On the process of dead water. Before me now, there is the court ruling of November the 20th, 2013, on the refusal to recognize the interested persons who submitted the statement. One of those was a regional social movement in support of the conception of social safety, cause of truth and unity. Judge Fidunina Svetlana Vasilyevna, I'm reading the quote, states, The arguments of the regional social movement in support of the conception of social safety in the course of truth and unity, about the fact that, in the case of a decision being made to recognize the book Dead Water as extremist material, the activities of the movement will contradict Article 16 of the Federal Law on Public Associations, are inconsistent, since those attached to the statement documents do not indicate that the objectives and activities of the movement are aimed at carrying out extremist activities. In other words, Judge Fidunina states that in order to enter the process, the social movement has to provide a charter in which it would be written that the objectives of its activities are extremism. Then she would allow the social movement to enter the process. Well, I said that if there is a next revolution, it will be against lawyers, because they reached the point of absurdity. Not only can no one take a step now without paying a lawyer, but they, together with the banks, are now the main exploiters of our time.